Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this panel on the United Kingdom and Finland. My name is Brendan Sims. I'm the director of the Centre for Geopolitics uh, at Cambridge. Um, uh, the Centre and the Baltic uh, Geopolitics Programme in general is extremely grateful uh, to Her Excellency Theresa Babir, HMA uh, Helsinki, for having us here. Um, that's a, a huge opportunity. We look forward uh, also to engaging uh, with you. The Centre for Geopolitics is committed to researching and understanding the geopolitical. Uh, that doesn't require a great deal of explanation nowadays, um, but we like to think at the Centre for Geopolitics, uh, we were looking at the geopolitical uh, sometime before it was, as we say in my own country, Ireland, uh, popular or profitable uh, to do so. Uh, so we are, if you like, we're in a, uh, somewhat ahead of the curve. Uh, and what we do in the Centre, uh, as well as looking at the geopolitical in the contemporary sense, we also very much emphasise the study of history. Uh, so the panel uh, we've convened this morning uh, will be looking at the relationship between the UK uh, and Finland, also with particular <coughs> emphasis on history. And we're extremely <coughs> fortunate uh, to have four distinguished panellists uh, with us today. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Um, we will have a discussion of about 25 minutes around the panel, and then we'll open up then uh, for discussion and questions from you uh, the audience. So our first speaker will be Professor Henrik uh, Meinander, um, Professor uh, of History at the University of Helsinki. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, he's one of Finland's best known and respected historians, uh, particularly uh, with his much discussed Mannerheim biography, which uh, I'm glad to hear is going to appear uh, in English language translation quite soon. Um, and of course, he's also the author of a book which is already out in English with Hearst Publishers, which is the history of Finland. Then he will be followed by uh, Johanna uh, Arnus Luoma, um, also of Helsinki. Um, and we're really pleased to have him because his particular expertise is in fact on the geopolitics of the Baltic after 1945. Uh, and not only that, but he's particularly uh, um, uh, aware of and um, expert on uh, the UK dimension. Uh, one of his books is uh, Britain, Sweden and the Cold War. Um, so we're, we're, we're hugely pleased to have you on the panel. Then um, our kind uh, hostess, um, Her Excellency Theresa Babir, um, as you all know of course, uh, HMA Helsinki. Um, she brings to this panel a wealth of experience on the Baltic Sea region in general um, and also more widely of British foreign policy. Previously she had served as HMA uh, Tallinn, uh, before that uh, uh, in Budapest uh, and in Moscow. Um, and then finally, uh, immediately here on my right, uh, the Right Honourable uh, Charles Clark, who is in fact the driving force behind uh, the, uh, the Baltic Geopolitics Programme uh, at Cambridge. Um, he was uh, Education Secretary and uh, Home Secretary. Uh, in a previous administration uh, in the UK and will be, uh, on account of that, many, well known uh, to many of you. So those are our, our panellists. Um, and I'm going to begin, I'm going to ask each panellist a question, uh, which they can elaborate on a bit, and then I will, we will have a general discussion, and then, as I say, we will open up. So to turn to um, Henrik Meinander, I mean, the UK and Finland is a little bit of, of, a, of a niche topic, uh, perhaps, um, but at the same time, uh, there's, I think, a lot to, to tell. Um, what, in your view, are the main themes in that connection uh, between the UK and Finland before 1945? One should begin with the, the, the fact that Finland was for uh, more than seven centuries a part of Sweden, and the Swedish Anglo relationship uh, was, of course, uh, important. Sweden had been an ally with, with, with France uh, during the uh, 17th, uh, 17th and 18th century, but during the Napoleonic Wars, then Sweden uh, actually then was more allied with, with Great Britain. The, the situation was then uh, that Russia tried to force Sweden to join the, the trade blockade against Great Britain in, in 1807. Sweden did not 
uh, applied to that. So a war began between Sweden and uh, and, uh, and and uh, Russia, and as a co consequence, Finland was joined to to Russia as a as a grand duchy. That's so to the big picture, but of course. Uh, Otherwise, the, the British-Finnish uh, relationship has, has long uh, traditions, you know, not least in trade, because when the Atlantic trade began and, and the Finnish, Finnish uh, products were, were sold to, to, to the world market, uh, Britain was, of course, very... The, 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 the tar production in the Swedish kingdom was predominantly uh, happening here in Finland. So all the ships that sailed over the... At Atlantic seas and you know built the British Empire were, were, were painted with Finnish tar. Uh, <clears throat> but then during the 18th century, of course, uh, Britain and Russia were the, the main, so to say, uh, dominant uh, great powers in, in Europe. Uh, Finland being part of, of, of Russia meant that during the Crimea War, uh, British and, and French. Uh, 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 fleet also uh, attacked Finnish coast. Uh, but actually there was one, one fight going on in, in August 1855, not against Helsinki, but the British and the French fleet bombarded the seafort of, of, of Viapori, Suomenlinna. Uh, but then as more uh, trade uh, happening, ha happened, uh, the seaway, the Finnish so to say, connections to Great Britain increased. So actually the Finnish trade with Great Britain was considerable already before First World War, and especially during during the interwar period, uh, Great Britain was the, the most important uh, export co country for Finland. Mm -hmm. During the war, uh, that could be you know, a lecture in, in its own. But uh, um, to put it short, uh, there was plans to to support Finland during the Winter War. Churchill ha had the idea that he wanted to cut the Swedish export of iron ore to to Germany. By a, by a landing in Narvik and then supposedly you know, uh, advancing to Finland, but the actual uh, uh, target was the Swedish uh, uh, iron ore, ore fields. That did not happen. Uh, then during the, uh, the, the second half of, of, of the war for Finland's part, actually Finland and Great Britain uh, were, uh, were in war against each other because Great Britain was forced to declare Finland uh, war in December 1941. Uh, there was a communication between our commander-in-chief Mannerheim and Churchill. Th they knew each other from, uh, from I think, 1910s onwards and had a, had a very, so to say, not straightforward communication, but a very kind of diplomatic way to uh, express themselves. Churchill wanted Mannerheim to promise that the Finnish offensive against, uh, you know, inner parts of Russia would not continue, but Mannheim could not give that promise because that, then he would have revealed the Finnish you know, defense plan. So that, uh, Britain was forced to declare Finland war, but any, there was not really any, any kind of warfare going on between the countries. Uh, in Tehran, 1943, uh, when actually the, the destiny of Finland was, was defined, the post-war destiny was defined, Churchill tried to convince Stalin that, 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 that it was uh, agreeable that Finland could at least keep uh, uh, Viipuri, Viabori, that was uh, one of the largest and, and, uh, uh, cities in, in, at the Karelia Insula, but uh, uh, Stalin was not in, in favor of that. But in, anyhow, there was, of course, a clear support for Finnish independence uh, among uh, the British and especially Americans. And a new order then began, of course, after uh, Armistice Treaty was uh, signed in, in Moscow in uh, September 1944. That was a, a treaty, Armistice Treaty between Soviet Union, Great Britain, and Finland. That in short. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for, for that um, uh, uh, account of the, the deep historical background before 1945. And the one or two points we might come back to around. Uh, the events of 1918, um, and perhaps also the Holland Islands, and that, that, that sort of thing. But I'll turn for now to Johanna um, and ask you to, to tell us a little bit about uh, the position after 1945. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for the invitation, too. And now I have to follow from Hendrik's concise summary from the Middle Ages to, the, to 1944. <laughs> 
Let's see how far, let's see how long this takes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, the situation in September 1944 was very difficult for Finland, but it also was a difficult one with the UK Finnish relations. But perhaps uh, one way for us to kind of think about the relationship of the two countries is about the frames uh, with and through which they see one another, kind of the context that one place is another country. And there are all, always several contexts at play at the same time. So mm -hmm. these are not as if we have only one frame mm -hmm. to see another country. But I think here, what is useful here is to think about the frames the British uh, used when they looked at Finland after mm -hmm. the Second World War. And the first one was an Eastern European frame. Finland in September 1944 was in within the Eastern European frame. The UK really didn't have any other than economic interests here, and it really couldn't do much to influence the fate of Finland, uh, perhaps in the way many Finns would have hoped it, it would be able to do. So Finland was within the Soviet sphere. It was within the sphere that the UK uh, actors saw as Eastern Europe. Now slowly, another frame uh, became uh, uh, the alternative, and that was the Nordic frame. There was never a kind of a Scandinavian frame to place Finland within, but the alternative to the Eastern European frame was the Nordic frame. And this was where, where how things started to move. So by the, by the end of the 1940s, this kind of Nordic frame existed alongside the Eastern European frame. And throughout the Cold War, I guess these two frames kind of coincided and balanced and competed with one another. Uh, Finland becoming Finlandized in the 1960s, 70s was thought to be kind of a development towards a strengthening of Finland's place in the Soviet sphere, i.e. the Eastern frame was again the frame one which one used when looking at Finland. And whenever the Nordic frame was strong with Finland's economic ties to Europe or with Finland's joining EFTA uh, with, a, with its own agreement in the 1960s, then that was uh, thought to be a kind of a positive development on the UK side as well. So very briefly, these two frames, let's keep this in mind, the Nordic frame and then the Eastern Europe, European frame, where slowly the Nordic frame became stronger, but there always was the option that Finland would move towards closer to the Soviet sphere, i.e. The, the Eastern European frame would become stronger. The Finnish view, view towards, towards the UK, there are three frames here. The first one is the transatlantic trans frame, where the UK has still a military power in Northern Europe as a significant ally uh, of the United States in Europe, a significant player in, the, in NATO's northern flank, uh, a significant ally of Denmark and Norway, and part of the balancing of the Cold War constellation in Northern Europe, where the UK, together with its, together of course, the United States as the leading power, uh, balanced Soviet, uh, uh, in, so Soviet power in, in Finland. So here, security was paramount in the transatlantic frame. Then there's the European frame, uh, another one that Finns uh, saw uh, used when they looked at the UK. And what was significant there was what Hendrik already mentioned, was trade. The UK as an export market, Finland's biggest export market in the 1950s in, in the world, and by far the biggest in Europe. Britain being the most significant country economically to Finland all the way until the 1980s when the trade patterns of the two countries started to, to differentiate or diverge in, and, 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 uh, and this kind of very strong bilateral relationship uh, was a thing of the past. And the third one is the global frame. Perhaps before Second World War, this was the only frame the Finns had. The UK with an empire and a global role, military might, economic, economy, trade and culture. But after the Second World War, the UK lost its empire. So it's lost, it, lost this one single uh, frame through which other countries could look at it, but it retained its cultural power. Mm -hmm. And this is the English language. This is, this is English culture, or the English-speaking peoples. Uh, not only the UK, but also other, uh, other uh, the United States uh, and the, kind of the whole Anglosphere in the world. And this was actually quite significant, I would say, and something that we haven't looked into uh, as much in detail as perhaps we as scholars should, should have. Should have. Because this also allowed the UK to influence Finland using something we call soft power. The BBC, World Service, uh, the British, cult British culture, television from the 1960s onward, kind of social contacts, travel uh, both ways, uh, was a significant, significant part of the way in which uh, Finland's position in the Cold War was also influenced. Propaganda activities, 
uh, have been covered in recent research, and they, and they, pay, they paint a really interesting picture about uh, the UK being able to use this kind of soft power in Finland when it didn't have the kind of military means it did uh, before the Second World War. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. So we have now um, galloped, if you like, to the present day, but we can slow down very slightly <laughs> <laughs> as uh, the contemporary uh, moment approaches. Yeah. Right. Um, Theresa, can I um, ask you now to say a few words mm -hmm. uh, on the present day relationship? Yep, really interesting. Thank yeah. you very much yeah. for, for these introductions because you, you feed directly into what I think the relationship is, is now. Um, let me start with uh, the, the place where Pre President Ninister started when I presented my credentials to him last summer, uh, which was football. Never underestimate the power of football. He told me he was interested about why there were so many football teams along the west coast of Finland, and the answer was British sailors. So um, he then leapt straight to security and defence. I'll get there, but I, I, I want to go a slightly different way to, uh, from football to security and defence. So agreed on the culture, agreed particularly on the English language. I think that is a, a, it's not exactly a secret weapon, but it's something which is really very powerful for, for us and which sort of keeps funding itself long after the British Council has, has yeah, more or less run out of money. Um, and there are many alternatives to the BBC. So, so that the English language, I think, is the gift that keeps on giving for us here, as in many other places. There are many other cultural ties. Next week, I will award an honorary KBE to Esa Pekka Salonen. Um, the musical ties are, are very deep and, and stretch very, very widely. Um, uh, in fact, the, the cultural ties broadly are, I, I think, still incredibly important. Everywhere I go, I find there are people who are doing British things <laughs> in, in sort of distant parts of Finland. So again, that has a life of its own. Um, the trade, I would say, uh, boy, do I wish we were still Finland's biggest trading partner. Um, we are not. I don't know off the top of my head where we are on that league table, but um, not as high as I would like it to, to be. Um, I think the days of truckloads and shiploads of stuff passing between our two countries are, are more or less gone. Um, but there is a huge amount of, of um, Finnish investment in the UK. We're looking, for example, at um, plants turning waste materials into energy. Um, we've got Finnish businesses looking at that. There's still a lot of paper production in the UK. Nokia setting up networks for, for well, all sorts of enterprises in the UK. So that continues. But I think probably the one that you would all expect me to talk about right at this moment is the defence and security cooperation. Um, where it seems, I mean, I haven't mentioned Brexit. I don't really want to mention Brexit because it's done, it's gone, it's ancient history. Um, but defence and security is the sphere in which we've carried on more or less as if nothing had happened um, on the, the Brexit side. We have worked very closely with Finland throughout recent years. Uh, certainly all the time that I was in Estonia, we were also working closely here uh, with the Finns on defence and security and without prejudging what is likely to happen in Finland in the next few days, weeks, um, I think it's safe to say that we will continue to be absolutely front and centre um, as Finland moves forward. We take the line very strongly, I'm sure the other ambassadors in the room agree, what happens next is Finland's decision. We will respect that completely, whatever the decision is, um, and we will be there when that decision is made to help take that forward. So we have uh, quite a lot of British soldiers here at the moment um, in Ninisalo on Exercise Arrow. Um, there is a huge amount of interest in the UK at the moment. In Finland, I saw someone, you will have seen this as well, that sales of books about the, uh, the Winter War have shot up from Amazon um, in recent weeks. And, and I'm really feeling that effect, that there is a, a renewed interest at the UK end in where is this place, what is it, who are these people, and what do we have to learn from them? So that, in a, a large nutshell, is where we are now. Thank you very much indeed, and um, particularly for bringing us um, up to speed uh, uh, with the present situation. Um, and indeed, Charles Clark bought a large number 
of books on, <laughs> on the Winter War uh, in the academic uh, bookshop, which are going to be in our uh, Baltic Library uh, in Cambridge, which is a, a section in, in the uh, Centre for Geopolitics. And with that, finally, I'll hand over to Charles. You, of course, dealt um, uh, with Finland uh, in your ministerial capacity, but you're also leading uh, the geopolitics, Baltic geopolitics program at Cambridge. Um, so I call upon you finally to deliver some remarks. Well, the most important uh, reference was by Theresa a moment ago when she talked about football, because uh, I have the uh, misfortune of supporting Norwich City Football Club, uh, which uh, has just been relegated from the Premier League uh, on Saturday, whose great striker is Timo Pukki, uh, who is, I believe, a genuine Finnish national hero. He, I think he's possibly scored more goals for fin the Finnish national team than any other striker in history. I'm not sure if Probably. that's true. Uh, but he's a great, uh, he's a great uh, Finnish role model, actually. In Norwich, people really admire him for the kind of person he is. Uh, and uh, that, I know that's not the centrality of this uh, this conversation, <laughs> but I couldn't uh, I couldn't let it pass without mm. reference to our uh, unfortunate football team. Um, when I was in government, uh, the most striking uh, relationship with Finland was when I was Secretary of State for Education, because as you know, the uh, record of Finland in education has been absolutely exemplary. Many people from Britain came to this country to try and understand why it was you were succeeding so well, what was so strong in your own approach to this. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that your influence on education reform back in the UK, but also worldwide, um, is very substantial indeed. Uh, when I was uh, Home Secretary, there were other relationships, mainly around the security issues, of course, uh, which were uh, all there. But I don't think that was as public a thing as the Finnish educational record, which was something absolutely celebrated. Um, as Brendan, Brendan said, we decided to set up this Baltic geopolitical programme, which we've got leaflets around uh, here, um, just over a year ago. Uh, it's really grown, it's very young, and it's started under COVID. Uh, and in my case, it's motivated by the very strong desire to say that particularly after Brexit, in Britain we have to raise our understanding, raise awareness mm. of the importance of the Baltic uh, for the UK, which is historic in the way that you both described a, a second ago, mm. but also contemporary. Um, the, uh, my own personal motivation came because my wife's mother fled Estonia in September 1944, in front of the Russians, and so I came to understand a dimension of history which, to be frank, though I'm re well educated and so on, I had very little idea of. And Brendan, who's a, um, apart from being a very nice man, is a very wide ranging man, said, Well, let's give it a go and see what we could do. Um, so we firstly had an event in June 2020 to mark the 80th anniversary of the Russian takeover of the three Baltic states. And then we had uh, our big launch event in January, uh, about 14, 15 months ago. Since when, we've had a whole string of events, over 20 now, uh, mostly online, but now some in person. Our biggest in-person event recently was analysing the importance of the Baltic in relation to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. On the 30th anniversary of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, to raise the historical question, how important was the Baltic, both the Baltic states, but also Finland, the Helsinki process, and so on, uh, through a whole series of, uh, of different aspects. And it was an academic seminar which uh, and symposium, which we were very pleased with. And we were really pleased by the level of interest uh, that there was in the project. So we intend to keep going. This visit today is an experimental thing, and I can tell you, Theresa, it triumphantly succeeded mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. uh, because we had to try and see if we could discuss what we're trying to do in other countries around the Baltic region. And I'm delighted you've all come today, and over the drink afterwards and so on, we're more than happy to talk about what we're doing. I think it might be helpful, Brendan, if before we break, I, we ask our colleagues from our advisory board just to identify themselves to the room mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, people can talk mm -hmm. to them about what we're trying to yeah. do. Mm -hmm. But it's summarised in, uh, in this document here. And essentially our programme has the following characteristics. 
First, it's about the Baltic. And of course, there are many organizations which are trying to develop Baltic cooperation. Second, it's about the UK and the Baltic. What is the particular UK dimension, which the three previous speakers have already highlighted uh, a number of aspects of that, which comes through very strongly. Thirdly, it's very much based in history, and this is Brendan's uh, contribution. He's a great historian, and the point being that uh, it's from understanding our history that we best can examine current geopolitical questions. It doesn't come out of a blue sky. It comes out of a tremendous long history. Both of you, uh, historically, the professors describing that history makes that point. Fourthly, we don't want to involve purely academics, but also practitioners, people like people from government, politicians, diplomats, uh, and so on, uh, and so that we get a fairly wide approach. And then fifthly and finally, uh, whatever subject we talk about, whether it's uh, energy, whether it's climate change, whether it's migration, we're always looking at it from the point of view of the geopolitical implication of that particular subject. And that's where we think we can de develop our unique approach. We form partnerships with universities in the countries around. We have a partnership with the University of Helsinki. Um, we've just recently welcomed and uh, developed our relationship to the University of Turku also and the University of Eastern Finland, the Vera Center, and we're hoping to develop those relationships over a period of time. Uh, and so that's where we are. We hope that we can build these relationships over the coming period, have a wide range of events. Uh, you mentioned uh, Professor Mainlander's book about um, Mannerheim, uh, for example, when we do get the English publication, we'd very much like to invite you to Cambridge to make a presentation, so to get a better, better understanding in Cambridge of the historic significance uh, of the man, its importance to UK-British relations. But we hope to have a series of continuing events, some online, some in person, to develop and foster the relationship. But we're delighted that so many of you have come today. And I should say we're exceptionally grateful to Teresa mm. uh, and also to Nicola Klaasa, who's somewhere in the room, and the Swedish, there she is, the Swedish ambassador uh, to Finland, who's been a member of our advisory board and a very strong supporter of what we're trying uh, to do. So we very much appreciate that and happy to talk about it further uh, afterwards. Thank you very much, Charles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tease out just one or two aspects of the bilateral relationship uh, um, with the panel, and then I'm going to open up uh, to discussion and to questions. I'd like to begin uh, again with, with Henrik. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the UK's role, if there was a significant role, in uh, Finnish independence, sort of you know, the period between 1917 and, say, 1919? Because I would imagine, just looking at it from outside, that there would be uh, a tension, I guess, with some people in London thinking that really Finland should remain part of uh, the Russian Empire to, if it was to be a, a white uh, Russia. Um, and presumably, uh, one would also think that the Royal Navy might have had a role, as it did in, uh, uh, obviously, uh, with Estonia. Um, but i uh, interested in your view on the dynamics, I mean, the extent to which the Royal Navy was important, or perhaps has been exaggerated on the British side, um, and how the British sort of conceived uh, uh, Finland as a sort of as a separate actor, it was sort of taking it on as a subject rather than just an object, which of course it had been uh, for previous centuries. Yes, actually, Great Britain was very important because Great Britain recognized the independence of Finland during the, the peace treaty mm -hmm. uh, negotiations in, in Paris mm -hmm. uh, in May, early May uh, 1990. And that was, of course, very important. <coughs> Finland, as a part of, of Russia, was in that sense a, a part of Entente. Mm -hmm. But uh, after the revolution had uh, uh, broken out, uh, then Finland declared its independence and then actually uh, joined, so to say, the German side. And, and it was German troops who actually supported the White Army uh, and actually had a decisive impact in, in spring 1918. Uh, I don't call that war a civil war. It was a part of the Russian Revolution and actually first of all, mm -hmm. because the war broke out as a chain reaction of the, of the race between the Bolsheviks and Germans to get the control of Finland. Anyhow, so it was very important that, that Great Britain uh, uh, recognized um, uh, Finnish independence and that had to do that Great Britain saw Finland as a part of this buffer against the Bolshevik 
rule in Russia. You have to remember that in spring 1990, it was not at all clear that the Bolsheviks would uh, survive. Uh, and at, uh, during the spring and summer 1990, there was a, a clear uh, opportunity to also uh, overtake uh, uh, the, the Bolshevik rule. So that was one uh, importance. Also, Great Britain, together with France and United States, uh, then also um, demanded that, uh, that we would get a democratic constitution and, and, and become a republic. Mm -hmm. So that had a, uh, actually a rather important uh, impact on the whole thing. Then it was a really complicated uh, development in the Baltic area. Uh, in the years of, of 1980, 1920. The British fleet played an important role and actually had an had a operation against Kronstadt, that is the leading uh, Navy uh, <coughs> uh, uh, base in, in close to St. Petersburg. And Stalin remember this, uh, this uh, operation when he then uh, discussed with the, the Finns 20 years later, that remember what happened in 1990 when you destroyed some, of, or not you, but, but together with the, 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 the British. So it was very important. And Great Britain played also a very important role when, when the, the so-called Åland question was decided. Uh, that is the, the island between, islands between Sweden and Finland. And the question was, to whom should these islands then be, be connected? Uh, the Sweden wanted uh, it, uh, the islands to be connected to Sweden, joined to Sweden, whereas Finland, as a, a, a new fresh republic, could not uh, accept this. Mm -hmm. uh, then, in the end, both the French and British saw that it was, uh, in the end, better that the islands would m maintain a part of, of Finland, although, uh, again, uh, demilitarized. Uh, and one uh, calculation was that in the next war, Sweden would anyhow be, be you know, somehow connected to Germany, and then it was better mm -hmm. that it was a part of, of, of Finland. But it, even more important was that Finland had fought the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the, uh, Finland needed that support, mm -hmm. and the Åland question was a part of this solution. Thank you very much for adding an extra layer there to, to the uh, really important role of the UK. Uh, in that period. Johanna, um, you said uh, that, of course, the UK was really very important during the Cold War on the northern flank vis-a-vis -vis Denmark and uh, Norway and, and uh, if you like, the Western Baltic. But of course, that's quite a way away from, fin mm -hmm. from Finland. Um, and in a sense, the Baltic was, I in many respects, a Soviet lake, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did Britain kind of cope with Finlandization and cope with its exclusion from what had previously been an area in which they had actually been quite active. Mm -hmm. um, did it then sort of become a total backwater or was there a sort of sustained interest? Well, I think the starting point in 1944 is actually mm -hmm. quite important here because then the, the British government made a fairly clear break with the past. We cannot do much about Finland. Mm -hmm. It's really lies, it's really on the other side now. Mm -hmm. They, they, let's have trade with them. They, it's an important source of raw materials, but we can't really do anything. Mm -hmm. there's, there's not much left of the earlier British influence in, in Finland. And that's because of the Soviet, Soviet position is so strong. Mm -hmm. Similarly in Poland, in other countries in Eastern Europe. So there was, mm -hmm. there was this uh, reckoning with this, with this shift mm -hmm. in, in London that is quite significant. As part of that was that, well, in this situation, Finland is basically lost strategically, mm -hmm. not necessarily economically, not necessarily society, we'll see what happens, then Sweden, Denmark, Norway are even more important than they have been in the past because now the, kind of the, the, the buffer is now Sweden and, and, and if, if Norway and, and Denmark needs to be defended by mm. NATO forces, Sweden needs, needs to be included in that. Mm. Finland there is just an alarm bell. It's mm. just a, it just gives a little bit extra time to react, but it's not really part of the equation any longer. Mm -hmm. Now, this started to change over time when it seemed that, okay, the Cold War might not actually turn into a hot war. This really is about a long-term con competition economically, uh, politically, culturally, of, of the hearts and minds of people. And then uh, I think this, the Finnish position started to change, uh, but never in the, in the fundamental uh, military to st strategic equation where the... East, the dividing line between East and West really was between Sweden and Finland. 
But what, what is interesting in the, in the, in the later uh, decades in the Cold War is this kind of the, the influence of, of where does Finland as a society and as a political system, as an economy, where does it lie? Mm -hmm. And there uh, were many things that the West could win and mm -hmm. the British could have a special role there because, because the Finns, in many ways, they, 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 of course, they looked at Washington and the United States, but often were a little bit afraid of the Americans when it came to political issues. But often the British were somehow easier to deal with because they were mm -hmm. old partners, uh, they were intelligence contacts going to the early years of the Republic, uh, economic ties, business ties, uh, people working and <coughs> traveling, and that was a little bit easier. So there, this special role for the UK mm -hmm. uh, developed over time. Uh, but this this was not an easy easy mm -hmm. thing uh, mm -hmm. to achieve with what the UK had. It really was soft power, mm -hmm. economic means. Things Thank like you. That. So my final question will be for Theresa Babir. Um, you. Uh, you said, of course, Brexit is ancient history, <laughs> but at the same, but at the same time, of course, there is uh, in Europe in general um, a, 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 a simultaneity, but also to a certain extent a, a tension between two ordering systems. The one is NATO, and the other is the European Union. Um, and uh, my question really would be. Given now, of course, we don't know the outcome, but it seems likely to me at any rate uh, that both Sweden and Finland will join uh, NATO. Um, one could, of course, envisage situations where unfinished Brexit business would cut across. I'm going to give you an example um, on the back. If there were to be a coming to grief between the UK and the EU on the protocol, um, in theory, the European Union would impose economic sanctions on the UK at the same time that the UK and the European Union were imposing economic sanctions on Russia, and the UK was actually protecting Finland through NATO. So these are, are sort of uh, um, uh, areas of, of tension and, and, and so on. And I, obviously I don't, wouldn't expect you to give away state secrets on, on this, but I just mean in your, you know, from a general point of view, whether you see that as a potential area of, of conflict. Um, I don't think there are any state mm. secrets on this. I think it's all quite quite open and I think it's really important at the moment to separate the defence and security relationship and possible NATO relationship mm -hmm. from everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to believe that Brexit is ancient history but you're quite right, it's, it's, not, it's not quite finished. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, let's be realistic, it did damage our relationship with Finland. Mm -hmm. um, we're working really, really hard to, to rebuild that and to look to the future. But there's no doubt in, I mean, and in most European countries, it was a massive shock. Um, it changed some of the mechanics of how we work, mm -hmm. um, and it also changed the way that people see us. And I think we have to be really, really open and frank about that. Um, and you know, we have some work to do to rebuild trust, and it's a massive opportunity to sort of reset. Yeah, I was the Brexit ambassador in Estonia. I am no longer the Brexit ambassador. Mm. I'm, I'm pressing the reset button and starting again, which I think is a very welcome message mm. here and is certainly easier than, than uh, my predecessor's job here or my previous job. But I think um, at the moment with the Ukraine situation and with the NATO debate, that is completely separate. I have not seen or heard anybody suggesting to me, as you just have, I shall worry about this now, that there could be sort of conflicting, um, uh, conflicting tides at, at work. I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any daylight between us on the security mm -hmm. relationship, on the defence relationship. I don't know how that will develop. I don't think, honestly, speaking personally, that European unity can hold forever. I think it won't be long before the cracks start to appear. But I don't see that turning into the EU versus NATO, mm -hmm. or somehow everybody turning against the, the UK. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's where we are at the mm -hmm. moment. Northern Ireland protocol is really, really tricky. Um, I'm possibly not the best person to, to ask about this, but what I would say is, remember, it's been true throughout Brexit, there's an awful lot of politics mm -hmm. in, in Brexit, and there's still an awful lot of politics mm -hmm. in, the domestic politics mm -hmm. in, in this. Um, I'm glad to see former politicians nodding wisely, so I, 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 I like to think I'm right on that. So um, 
even those things are not going in, in straight lines. But uh, no, I would see no threat at, at the moment, um, and certainly no clash between the EU sort of security structures mm -hmm. and NATO. Thank you. So uh, a lot of history, uh, a lot of connections which persist to the present day, some complexity perhaps. Uh, now it's your opportunity um, to ask questions. It would be helpful to me at any rate if you gave your name when you do so um, and if you have an affiliation uh, you would share that as well. Um, who would like to begin? Yes sir. I'm Neil Senius, former employer from the Finnish Foreign Association and I would like to ask the ambassador what kind of securities or guarantees can Finland get from the UK to join? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Can I ask you to be patient? <laughs> <laughs> for um, possibly not for very long. Um, it is, and, and I think I'm safe here because I'm quoting my, my defence minister, inconceivable that the UK would leave Finland and or Sweden unprotected in the event of something happening. Now, exactly what that looks like, I can't imagine. I, I don't think we need to imagine exactly what that might, might look like. Um, but that, you know, that offer has been made and uh, just, just hang on a little bit and, and let's, let's see what happens. Realistically, we think it won't be very long before we are welcoming Finland and or Sweden, hopefully and Sweden, into NATO. They are sovereign decisions. We're not pushing in, in either direction. We're talking about covering the, the gap the grey zone between the two um, and I don't know what NATO will decide on this, it's all over the UK media this morning that we should as William Hague actually saying we should be able to have an instant NATO mm. membership decision um, I suspect that might be a bit optimistic but we'll try and keep the gap to to a minimum um, watch this space <laughs> Thank you. That was actually the question that I was going to ask okay. you, of course about, <laughs> about the grey zone, so it's good to have an answer Sorry, you were the next yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Sakari Boist, a member of the Finnish parliament and also Cambridge alumni, so <laughs> I start to visit back home, so to speak. But I would also like to ask about a very topical issue. Maybe Finland and Sweden are not part of NATO yet, I would say, but we are part of this JEF collaboration. Mm -hmm. So how do you think the dynamics of JEF will join, uh, change after the membership? It's a really good question, thank you. I forgot to mention the JEF earlier, I was trying to be concise. So the JEF, the Joint Expeditionary Force, um, is an organisation whose, whose time has come. So for the last five years in Tallinn, I heard about the JEF occasionally. Nobody had any idea what it was or what it did. It was just, you know, everything was about NATO. And then I came here and realised that the, the JEF was a really big thing in its, own, in its own right. It's become now not just a military organisation, but a political organisation, the Jeff leaders were meeting um, in March in, in London. And I think even six weeks before that, if you told me we could get Jeff leaders mm -hmm. together, I would have laughed at you. So, so the Jeff has sort of found its feet. I think it will be an important part of this interim cover um, that we know there are you know, 10 like-minded nations who are ready to, to come together if necessary. Um, to be honest, I would expect that if, if NATO membership is applied for and, and when it's achieved, that the GEF will slightly fall away. But the GEF, I think it will remain very useful. It's a flexible organisation. It's opt-in. So the GEF is the UK plus one of the other members, Nordics, Baltics and the Netherlands. That's all it needs to be, UK plus one. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to opt out or apologise or you know, be too busy or whatever. It is entirely opt-in and it's also entirely flexible. So there's all sorts of things that the Jeff can do that NATO can't or wouldn't do. So I think um, it was actually the second thing the president talked to me about after football was the Jeff. That, yeah, that's how high it was on, on his priorities. So I think it remains very relevant for now. I would predict we'll start to forget about it a little bit as and when NATO comes on stream. Don't write it off. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else on the panel wants yes. to comment on, please, on these questions. Yeah, questions. Johanna, please. But I think this is quite interesting uh, since uh, Brexit, as the ambassador here said, I think it, it clearly damaged uh, British, uh, Nordic, British, Finnish, British, Swedish, 
British Danish relations because it removed an, a forum where they mm -hmm. met and collaborated the U European Union and the and especially the council, so where they were kind of as, as if they were equals, uh, collaborating. And now, uh, if Finland and Sweden join, join NATO, there will be not only a Nordic defense alliance again, but there's also the question of who's the senior big power uh, that they collaborate most closely with. And I, two months ago, I thought it would be Germany. Now I think it might be the UK, mm -hmm. given what's going on in Germany, how painful that process mm -hmm. in Germany is of their Zeitenwende. And the Americans would probably leave it to the British quite happily mm -hmm. in the end. So this is quite interesting because we are restoring the UK back mm -hmm. into European uh, collaboration. <laughs> and now it looks like more like the ideas the UK has always had about intergovernmental opt-in kind of collaboration and not the kind of Franco-German ideas that mm -hmm. we have become used to. So I think we are witnessing a, a big change here. I'm looking at my German and US colleagues in a straight line down there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 so not being diplomatic. Th there are a lot of hands up. Is there anybody who has a question on the history for us? Because I'm going to privilege them for the moment. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, Pre-1945? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have a question on that period. Ah. <laughs> well, you said history, so I'm trying to define... Yes, yes. So, well, the history was sort of pre-2000, um, because we do have a distinguished <laughs> cast of historians here. So are there any questions on the history before... I appreciate there's a lot of interest on the NATO front, but... Okay, well, may maybe these questions will come to you. Sorry, you had a question in any case. Yeah, yes, thank you. My name is Arti Dolman, and I'm with the Finnish Foreign Scholars Forum. And... Uh, I, I would just like to uh, suggest that we should have another panelist here, someone uh, representing uh, somehow the position of the United States if we're all going into NATO, because we know that NATO does nothing without the approval of the United States, hardly at all. And, uh, and if we look at how this is going to affect, for instance, Finnish domestic politics and politics in the Finnish uh, uh, Finnish uh, in, in, within Finland. We should think about what has been happening in the recent past. We may, for instance, think of the, the period uh, leading up to the Iraq War and how uh, Britain got out involved in that because of problems with the United States and intelligence that was being provided by them, which in the end led to the, uh, well, the I think, was a major factor in the, uh, the defeat of the Blair government and also a major defeat uh, which led to uh, the, the success of the, the, uh, the the Eurosceptics taking power and, uh, and the, the, their uh, Brexit campaign, and it, this was all because of problems with the United States. Uh, and there is there are uh, credible reports that the problems in the Ukraine also occurred because of that, because of diplomatic efforts which failed to keep Russian influence, and actually were apparently were uh, the American uh, Under Secretary of State was involved in in activities to remove uh, a pro-Russian president there, and this then created a crisis in the country where the more uh, Russian affiliated people, sensitive people moved and a civil war started out. And this was because of the United States and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and which is the leading uh, influence in NATO. So uh, is this something that uh, we should be concerned about? Because there are also cleavages within NATO on this particular crisis that we're having now. That will we have cleavages in the Baltics as well. Mm -hmm. I suggest that Charles Clark, if he wants to, responds mm. to that question because it's taken us back into. Uh, I mean, I'll just make a very, I'll just make yeah. a very uh, yeah. brief comment. Yeah. Um, my only observation would be that I think it's a mistake to assume that NATO is simply the tool of American foreign policy. Mm. I think it's a much more complicated set of relationships. Of course, the United States is a very important player, and certainly in the UK, we've always recognised the importance of their role. But I think I've had some other conversations, even here, which lead me to think people are saying it's just simply the US deciding what they want, and NATO just goes along with it. And I just don't think that's quite right. Um, and in fact, I think the... Uh, I'm not trying to diminish the US relationship, of course it's important, but I think what we will see is an increasing working together of the European members of NATO, uh, including with non-NATO members. So, for example, if... Finland and Sweden decided not to join NATO, I think there'd still be a collaborations of various kinds taking place. But um, I don't myself believe that it can simply be seen as an American foreign policy uh, initiative. I know some people portray it like that, but I don't think that's entirely correct. Why do you think that? What is an example of the 
NATO doing something which the United States disapproved. I, I don't think there is any example of that because uh, the whole basis of the NATO is approval by all mm. the members of NATO mm. of what's happening. Mm. Um, and so there isn't, uh, I couldn't say mm. here as an example, mm. but I think, and I'm not saying this is what you were saying, sir, but I, I think there's a conspiracy view that is around that everything NATO does is on some plot uh, of the Americans, and I simply don't think that's a correct picture. Thank you. Now, there were various hands up in the back. Um, who have I missed? I have, have the questions that were being asked already been answered? Yes, Naman. Uh, my name is Naman, my research is at the Centre for Geopolitics and I'm Swedish. I'm curious about how quickly public opinion has changed on NATO membership, mm -hmm. both in Sweden but also in Finland. It goes from 20% to 60% in a few months. Could one imagine it going the other way uh, if there's a Trump re-election? And should a decision be made on such a rapidly changing situation and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, two years of 60% level may be more stable basis for NATO membership or uh, staying out. So I propose, if they, if they are happy to do so, that our two Finns mm. respond to that. Um, Henry, would, would you like to begin? Yes, uh, of course, you have to remember that this, uh, this choice or this uh, decision that has to be now taken, it has to be taken, uh, is in a way not very radical, because the Finnish cooperation with NATO, especially with the uh, uh, United States, ha has continued since early 1990s, and since then, uh, our, so to say, synchronization with NATO has continued and has deepened. So actually, technically and military, it's, it's not a big step. And the Finnish government has, since 1995, in its program, always had this so-called NATO option, in which it, it declared that if the situation in European security is changed, the Finnish government might reconsider its uh, non allied policy. And now we have reached, you know, obviously, objectively speaking, this situation when we cannot really see that it is possible for us to continue with the same kind of relationship that we had with Russia uh, at the same time as we deepened our uh, contacts with NATO. Both those who have been against NATO and those who have been in favor of NATO in some way have tried to, you know, actively forget that this is what it has actually happened. You know, as you know, Sweden have had very close uh, cooperation with NATO since 1950s. It's not either for Sweden, military speaking, uh, a huge step. It's more kind of ideological, kind of has to do also with domestic policy, that the Swedish social democrats uh, have been very successful in describing welfare and neutrality as something that goes together. Uh, now, this kind of description has never been the case with Finland. Mm -hmm. So for Finland, it's not an ideological uh, decision. It's, it's, it's a, a very much a, 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 a consequence of what Russia is now doing in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Johanna, you have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So a shift from 20 to 60, 65% in, in a few weeks. I don't know how to explain that as a scholar. I, have, I can only make some assumptions about that. But it indicates that perhaps uh, there was something going on already before uh, 24th of February. Mm -hmm. So it's unlikely, again, as a researcher, it's unlikely that people would have completely changed their worldviews about NATO and Russia and, and, and defense, military defense and things like that overnight. It's more likely that there were already elements of this kind of thinking out there and the, and the opinion polls probably didn't catch, capture that, mm -hmm. that there was something about uh, the Finnish opinion that, that over the last years and perhaps even longer, maybe the last two or three decades of the whole post-Cold War era and how to deal with Russia. And so there was readiness. I think there was psychological and mental readiness for this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, a change, of change of opinion. And I think this is what we, I think we should look at what went on before as historians, 24th of February, and that came, came uh, uh, out in the open. Uh, so so soon, but I, I agree. It's not necessarily ideological position. It's it's the Finns' view about Russia, and about uh, the feasibility of military defense. So you can defend yourself. The Ukrainians have shown that you can defend yourselves against the Russians, but you can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's easy as that. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take arms, 
you need someone to help you. So it's about defense and about Russia. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we Is it a very quick question, ma'am? Well, just, yeah. uh, my name is Ulana Adelwa, I'm the co-chair of the English-speaking Union of Finland. Mm -hmm. But just a, a, a question to our British distinguished members. Would you, in Britain, uh, have uh, an idea at all how it meant for us Finns this Brexit thing? Mm -hmm. Because back to history, why did Finland join the EU? Not for economic reasons, not really, but for security. And why <laughs> was it so fantastic to be a member of the EU? Yes, because especially Britain had the nuclear power, the fantastic defense forces. And then suddenly, Brexit. And now the feeling, oh, how are we doing now? And then, what is Russia going to do? And then the worst thing happened, they did it to Ukraine rather than to us. So that's why I think that fear was there at NATO quickly, quickly, quickly now, if possible. Thank you. So I think the question is, um, you know, have we understood? I, in, in, yeah. a, in a sense, uh, Brendan, I'm the wrong person mm. to ask. I was a strong believer in British membership of the EU. Uh, I was strongly opposed to Brexit. And I do think that uh, uh, the decision was taken in an uncons unconsidered way, even despite the length of debate that took place. Uh, however, what the ambassador said is completely correct. This decision was taken. And so the challenge is, how does the UK begin to re-establish relations with other European countries? And actually, it's not a political initiative, this programme. Uh, it is an academic initiative. Uh, but I hope that this programme helps to build those relationships and build that understanding mm. over a period of time. And of course, we're so happy to hear now what the ambassador said as well. And, and I, think, I, I think with the concerns about the behaviour of Russia at the moment, uh, which must be very much on your minds living right here as you uh, are, uh, this kind of set of relationships, I, I think, takes on a big importance. Mm. You might want to ask David to say a word. Mm. Uh, David, Sir David Liddington was the British Foreign Office Minister, and I think it's not really any secrets to say he wasn't a fan of Brexit either. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, I, And he's a member of our advisory board, and mm. I was going to say we might introduce the members yeah. of our advisory board. But why don't you just ask David to answer her question, because he was, <laughs> he, he was uh, intimately involved at the core of government with his good friend okay, Boris so Johnson. David, 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 I'm on the advisory board. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. In the deep end. Uh, and um, so I was in my time in Parliament. I, uh, amongst the other things I did in government, I was David Cameron's Europe Minister for six years, from 2010 to 2016, and then serving Theresa May's government after that. So, and actually, and I, I get that completely from two angles. Um, one, that I remember when I was campaigning for a Remain vote, that. Um, in my own mind, while the economics was important, the trade and all that, it was the geopolitics that was of greater significance at the end of the day. Um, and, and I do think one of the challenges looking ahead is how, in the light of Ukraine and Putin's aggression, um, not only how does NATO develop, but how does NATO and the CSFP, CSDP elements of the EU how, it all, how does it all fit together, particularly in a world where, take your question, sir, I actually think the bigger risk is that the United States loses interest in European security rather than that they're trying to, um, to, to, to get rid of, um, to, to dictate, dictate everything. I mean, and that's not everyone in the but there's an element of public opinion in the United States that thinks Europe's been freeloading on the US taxpayer for its security for far too long. We have to exercise greater leadership as well as spend more money. Um, the, other, the other point, though, was that um, I think that I used to sit in council meetings, and when it came, for example, to how you responded to Russia in 2014, and, and whether we could resist the pressure from some of our uh, fellow members to relax sanctions within 12 months of uh, the, the, them being imposed, and, and within 12 months of annexation, quite near that push was on. You know, I was arguing alongside the Finnish minister, the Swedish minister, the Danish minister, uh, the three Baltic ministers, the Dutch minister, um, against, I mean, 
that little point thing. This is the people of the South <laughs> who uh, were a little, uh, 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 a little bit more willing to move in that direction. So I think we, it's now, as Charles said, the task now is not how do we rerun Brexit. That, that in, I think, neither the British people nor, frankly, the 27 governments of the EU want to go through all that agony again. And there's not a consensus in the UK about rejoining. So it's, there's no point in going down that path. It's, right, what relationship do we want to have now that best serves our mutual security, our mutual prosperity? And that, and that I think, is where programmes like this can be important in building that understanding. Thank, thank you very much. I think that was a really helpful yeah. question, and, and it allows me, in, in conclusion, to underline that at the Centre for Geopolitics, our view is that whatever line you take on Brexit, uh, in geopolitical terms, it's clear that post-Brexit, uh, the rest of Europe is more important than the UK, uh, to the UK than it was before Brexit, because you know it, it's now uh, the European Union is the most important neighbour of the United Kingdom, and in my opinion, our opinion, uh, in many ways, actually the UK is the most important neighbour uh, of the European Union, and so re understanding and uh, redefining that relationship uh, is a huge part of what we do. But, but we, we must really finish the formal proceedings now. As Charles said, um, before we break, I, I did want to um, ask all the members of the advisory uh, board just to introduce themselves very briefly. Uh, Sir David Liddington's already done so, um, so you can uh, uh, go to him during the, um, during the reception. Um, but uh, so Her Excellency Nicola Classe uh, is also a member. Uh, Ambassador of Sweden to Finland. I think you all know her. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas Matusik, uh, former uh, a German ambassador to, to the UK. Uh, David Kearns, uh, former uh, UK ambassador uh, to uh, Sweden. And Lord Geoffrey Mount Evans. So have I missed out anybody else? I'm, I don't think so. And we also have members of our our team uh, um, here as well, but they'll introduce themselves uh, to you uh, in due course. So um, with that, I would like to draw the formal proceedings of the panel to a close. I think it's been hugely um, uh, informative, hugely stimulating. I think we've uh, covered uh, a massive amount of ground historically, uh, but at the same time we've, we've uh, aired the contemporary issues extremely well. So I'm very grateful uh, to uh, all four panelists uh, for their contributions to you, the audience, for your questions and comments. But particularly, of course, we're thankful to Theresa Babir for having us here. And with that, um, uh, I would like you to uh, join me in showing appreciation, and I will then hand back to her. So thank you very much. Cool.